Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And a lot of you are looking for ways to create more profit within your dental practice. And I've got one of the worldwide experts on how to do that. My good friend from Breakaway Practice, Dr. Scott Luna, and he is brilliant with this. So do me a favor. You don't want to miss this. Grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show and thank you again for watching this. We are having so much fun and getting so much great feedback about what you want to see. And so keep giving us to that. Give us that. We're gonna we're gonna do our best to make sure that we can have make this happen in a timely fashion. And uh, again, today is no exception. We're gonna be talking about how we can create more profit within your dental practice. And I've got the guy that's gonna help us do that. Now, a couple show notes before we get started. Uh, we are shooting this live on Facebook, so as you have questions come up, please type them into the feed, and I'll ask Scott directly during the middle of the broadcast. And we're loving the questions so much that we're giving away a free Apple iWatch every single week to the best question asked and two tickets to our practice growth seminar called Activate, so you don't want to miss that. Now, I want to talk about my guest today because... I had a chance to go to a seminar, actually I'd heard about it, called Breakaway Practice. And uh, I told the story last time, Scott, when you are on, but it's so true. I was, I was intrigued. I was like, ah, I got to check this out. I called you. You said, come on down. Um, and I always look at things with a little, you know, with a little bit of a filter. I'm like, well, what, who is this guy, first of all? And what, can, what, is he, what can he teach? And it blew me away, hands down, without question, the best practice management seminar I'd ever been to, hands down. Uh, it was overwhelming how much information you gave us. Uh, and I went through the combination courses that you had back then. I came back with those huge manuals, and I now have enough work to do for about 10 years. So uh, if people don't know who Scott Luna is, can you tell them who Scott is and then what breakaway practice is? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on again. Um, you know, I'm a dentist by training. I um, opened a practice from scratch right out of school, and it was, uh, it was a huge practice. We were seeing 350 new patients a month. And uh, going through this, seeing 350 new patients a month as a new grad was grueling. It was challenging. Uh, but, it, but we also were very successful because of it. That success actually led to multiple practices. Uh, by the, my fourth year as a dentist, we had, I had 10 associates. Um, and I went again through a bunch of grueling stuff, figuring out how to control overhead, how to market properly, how to manage people. I learned a lot of lessons the really hard way. Um, I since sold those three practices, and I then built seven more from scratch. And those practices were far away from my home, five and a half hours away. So I had to learn a whole new thing. How do you, how do you have profitable, successful practices doing good dentistry uh, from far away, not, not being an on-site owner? That was grueling to learn how to do that. And, and through all these lessons, uh, we, we began to see some pretty uh, cool hacks on how to hack your way into success by solving the riddles that we have in dentistry. Mm -hmm. That led us to start teaching other people how to do it in our seminars. It led us to opening practices in partnership with dentists. Um, it led us to even manage practices from afar. And so you fast forward through all of this today, uh, we are connected to about 370 offices. There's about 80 of those we helped build from scratch. And uh, we do all kinds of stuff from marketing to billing and insurance and phones and IT to building them and managing them and seminars to those that just want to learn what we do. Um, you know, I, I know I look 38. I'm, 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 I'm really 22. Uh, <laughs> but now I, I, you know, I've been pretty beat up by this. Um, but so have we all, haven't we? We've all made decisions that we learned from. And what breakaway practice has done 
is had to make a whole lot of decisions and learn from a lot of those things to find those key moments that result in success. Mm-hmm. And then we have focused on those key moments and helping other dentists and, and my own practice has become very successful. Yeah. And uh, you you are just a great, great student of the game of what makes a great dental practice. And I want to do a ton of these with you. And the overhead thing is a big conversation. Now, I before we get into the details, I always love to talk about why this is such a, an interesting conversation, because it seems like overheads are rising. You hear the conversation all the time. Dentists are coming out with more debt. Is it more expensive to practice? I mean, I, I can anticipate what you're going to say already, but what are, what are some of the trends and why is this conversation? so important well um, the if you if you look at the national averages for uh, income for dentists it's gone down for years now uh, you know it, it used to be higher back when I graduated than I think it is today um, so it's been going down slowly and, and there's a lot of things causing this I mean there's the commoditization of dental care there's a the proliferation of corporate groups um, there's the lower reimbursement rates there's a the higher cost with supplies with equipment um, the, the, of course there's rents are going up. People are moving their practices into class A real estate to compete. And that of course has higher rent. Uh, there's just a lot, a lot of things going on. Regulations are going up here in Texas, for example, in the last 10 years, we've had additional taxes been put on to us. We've got the burden of healthcare, uh, insurance. So incomes have been going down. And on top of that, dentists have been graduating with higher student loan payments. And so this is this is a tough situation, especially for a dentist that's got debt. Right. Um, I think overhead control is vital, and you know there's good ways of doing it, and then there's maybe bad ways of doing it. And I think it's important to define what what's a good way of controlling overhead, what's a bad way of controlling overhead. Right, and you have hundreds and hundreds of dentists come to your yeah. seminars. And, and, and again, I'll just speak to the dentists that might be doing this. You know, they're so classically trained that they only focus on production. Well, there's a certain point where you can only pro- produce so much, and that's just a lot of teeth. And so you have to create that margin between the bottom line and the top line. Um, and so where do we start? Like, take us through this. Now, you, you're you out of it. There's four ways that we can lower overhead, but there's a lot of components to this. So, Scott, what do I need to know if I'm a young dentist watching this? Yeah, well, first of all, I ask, so we, we lecture to 12 or 1,300 people um, a year in, in our kind of boot camp, high-intensity um, two-day seminar, and we look at what do they produce, what do they collect, what do they take home, and uh, so first thing to realize is there's a problem, because we have a lot of dentists come to our seminars that are doing a million up, actually most dentists that come are doing more than a million, um, many of them doing more than two, um, yet they're taking home very little. They're actually taking home as much doing a million and a half as what I took home doing seven, 800 grand. Um, so th- I think that we've in a way as an industry gotten almost, I, I don't know if it's the right word, but drunk on volume on high production. And we've been oblivious to profitability, um, in a way as an industry, we, we, we don't go to the, to our friends and brag about our profit. We brag about how many, how much we produce and how many new patients we got? Problem mm-hmm. is, I've produced, I've had an organization produce five million a year and not made any money, and that was a horrible year. Um, <laughs> you see, so uh, there's a problem. There's a big right. problem. You know, we've got docs doing in relatively normal practices doing 1.1 to 1.2 million a year in production, and they're taking home 600 grand. Mm. That gives us the ability to make great choices without compromising our practice. Right. When we're doing 1.2 5 million a year and taking home 200 before we then make all of our loan payments and everything else, we put it, we're put into a position of compromise, right. compromise on care, compromise on hours, on lifestyle, on staff. Um, that's how I think we get burned out. And that's how we do bad dentistry. If we are, yeah. if we're really struggling with profitability. Yeah. And you compromise on sleep. If you're producing that with such a little profit. So, yeah. um, so this is a big deal, as you can imagine. Um, we've heard it for a long time. It's not what you produce, it's what you keep. But there's a lot of things that dentists may not know. And the way you do your training, you really teach people to be a better CEO. So how do we become better CEOs in this? Um, you've got buying groups, you've got 
you know, you talk about acquisition costs. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Where do we start? Okay. Well, I, you know, I'd like to talk about topics like um, supply management. Um, that's an easy one to fix immediately. Um, I'd like to talk about marketing. How should we spending our? How should we be spending our marketing dollars? Uh, we could also talk about things like cleaning up the accounts receivables, the money that's owed to us, as well as maybe maximizing our effectiveness on the phones, which helps drive up um, collections and profits. Um, and so, so those are the kind of the topics. So, so the first one, uh, supply management. I, I think that as an industry, we think we dentists think that um, having low um, supply overhead means. Uh, the cheapest price we can find online somewhere for this particular cotton roll. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that's absolutely not the case. Right. So it's a component. What The price we spend on a cotton roll is definitely a component. But that is not one of the driving factors in saving money. We have to look, we have to kind of step back away a, a little bit and look at our decisions as a whole. So if I were to buy a practice, let's say... I were to buy your practice and I look at the supply overhead and let's say it's above 5%, mm -hmm. 5% of collections. I'm ringing the alarm bell saying we probably have a problem here. It should be much less than that. Right. And that's, that's interesting because a typical practice has supply overhead at eight, 9%. They like mm -hmm. to think it's low, but it's not, not when you look at the financials. So what I'm doing is I'm first asking ourselves, do we have the right formulary? Meaning, have we chosen the right brands? Um, because there's, this is the way it usually is. Whatever dental assistant we have assigned to order supplies mm -hmm. is ordering all kinds of stuff, all right. kinds of brands, at all kinds of quantities. And, you know, the way we organize supplies in dental offices is ridiculous. We've got upper cabinets here. we got drawers in that room. we got a tiny little closet in the back. we got all kinds of junk in the operatories. And it's very common for dental assistants to order in bulk of a brand that we maybe won't use the rest of the year and hide it away in all these places. Mm -hmm. So, so again, like coming back, formulary, is it the right brand? When I'm choosing the brand, I'm either choosing the best quality, if quality matters, or I'm choosing a brand that's affordable, if quality doesn't matter, like a cotton roll. Right. Um, and then I'm not trying to have 20 or 30 different manufacturers. I want to have a limited number of manufacturers because that enables me to take advantage of manufacturer rebates at a much higher level. Okay. So that's kind of step one. What are we ordering? What's the formulary? This has to be owner driven, not dental assistant driven. It takes, you know, an hour of work to set the formulary. And that alone can save a ton of money, like tens of thousands of dollars a year. Right. That alone, the right formula. Yeah. Um, and, and you have a system, you know, if, if you've ever been to break, breakaway practice, you can see Scott's systems, you have the bins. And so do you, as, as setting up the formula as the owner, do you like almost square them off and say, Hey, look, I want this many of this, this many of this, and it's a system. And then the assistant follows your system. Is that what you're, what you're speaking to? Well, that, that's part of it. Yeah. So, so pick the right brands mm -hmm. of products. And then the second thing that maybe you're alluding to is, are we carrying enough inventory on stock or are we carrying too much? Right. Because for some reason, docs think, oh, I can save five cents if I order in bulk today. So let me order a year's worth. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is they change preferences to a different brand. And then they got all this wasted material or the wasted material is expired because it's so old or it's hidden in multiple places because it doesn't all fit in the shelf right here. And so wherever it's hidden then gets forgotten and you keep reordering it. This is the real stuff that happens. So yes, to your point, we have an area where we store supplies. We have our own kind of specific way, but it's definitely demarcated that says if we're going to order bibs, we're not going to order any more than what fits in this spot, like mm -hmm. taped off, that spot on the shelf. Mm -hmm. We're only going to order that much. Um, so, so what's the formulary? How much do we order? Then we say, well, how frequently should we order? We believe we should be ordering 
once every week. And when I say every week, we actually, um, you know, that might sound like a lot to some dentists that order once a month or once every two months. Um, but we say once every week because it enables us to carry a smaller amount of inventory in our shelves. And it enables us to make changes very quickly to if we decide we want a new burr or a new brand of composite or impression material. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and the reason why, you know, it, it's important to carry a little on your shelf is because in essence, everything that's on your shelf is cash that's been locked away from you. Right. You carry 50 grand worth of supplies at any given moment. That's 50 grand you can't access anymore. It's stuck on your shelf. But if you carry 15 grand, then you freed up $35,000. It's right in your pocket that go buy a new car or go invest in better marketing or whatnot. Grow your practice with it. But it's smart to carry as little as feasible on hand to not buy in bulk. Okay. Yeah. I know it's counterintuitive because we think we save money when we buy in bulk. But there's so many unintended consequences that happen when we buy in bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't, we don't believe it's the right way of doing it. Absolutely. Any other considerations on supplies that we should know about that we're not aware of? Yeah, big time. Um, so uh, a big, the biggest problem, I guess, maybe I should have started with this, is the fact that we just order supplies based on what we think we need and want, as opposed to what the budget says. Mm. So we will set a supply budget. Um, we, if we want supplies to be at 5%, of total collections, then what we'll do is we will take last month's total collections and we'll take 5% of that divided by four weeks. And that's our weekly order budget. We won't order more than that. And if you do the math, it's actually last month's collections divided by 80 is this week's budget. Yep. So if we start placing the orders through Shine, for example, and now we're above budget, our budget was two grand and we're at three, we reduce quantities to get back to two. Right. We have to have disciplined accountability. Otherwise, this gets way out of hand. It just becomes a shopping spree. It's like right. going to Target and eating five things and walking out with 20. Like we can't do that, right? Right. Um, we have to have discipline when it comes to this. Yeah. Now, now that's budget. There's one more aspect, and that is um, price. And um, you know, I'm I'm now blatantly going to promote my company, so I do apologize. You can just mute me right now for five seconds. You don't have to apologize for anything. Okay. But what we, you know, the the practices that we help operate, we're we're doing their phones, we're building an insurance, marketing. We might be doing one of many things. We have gone in and implemented best practices for managing supplies which includes oversight and the budget. It includes creating an ideal formulary of supplies with brands. It includes maximizing rebates for manufacturers. And it includes preferred pricing at large discounts compared to what a private dentist would get on their own. It is a way to in implement best practices. And docs that come on our platform that do that, which we have, you know, you heard me, hundreds of practices, right. um, they save a fortune on supplies because of price, because of um, proper budget controls and, and proper formulary, and on equipment, and on lab fees, and on software, our best, our, we call it our cost savings program. It is implementing best practices and saving money because of that on all types of things that we spend money on in the dental office, like overnight costs are slashed down due to best practices and preferred pricing yeah. um, with major suppliers and manufacturers and labs that everyone's heard of. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, that's what we put together to try to help solve our own overhead challenges. Right. And it's really refreshing to hear you say, and I knew you were going to say this, it's not about just going cheap. You know, it's about being smart. That's really what it is. That, so, right. and, and by the way, who wants to work with the worst, cheapest impression material in the catalog. I mean, Nobody. Like, there comes an ethical question around it, doesn't it? Right. So we can't just go cheap with everything. We have to have the right products with the right cost controls and the right um, ordering process at the right price. Like, price right. is part of it, but, but there's other parts, too. 
Um, this is not going on Amazon and eBay from China and Darby Shine, Patterson, Safeco, and Buying Group and spending a ton of time picking and choosing bad products and having shipping time screwed up and having orders lost and not tracking anything and ordering in bulk over here. I mean, that is a disaster. Right. Um, we, I, we, that's not how Starbucks would order their stuff, right? Nope, not so at all. Why would we not want to act like a professional, buttoned up, successful company? Like we, we would want to follow similar best practices as the most successful companies by, like a Starbucks. Amen. Amen. Now go into the marketing too, because marketing you'd mentioned, that's, that's another component of overhead that people just spend a lot of money and it's emotional. Um, take us into the overhead component of marketing. Great. Um, so first of all, we track, we listen to every phone call on the marketing side. We see if they schedule, we tag them in the schedule. We see how much they produce. We see how much we collect before we analyze our data. And we do that with some practices that have an unlimited budget. They're a startup. They just need more and more patients. And then we do it with some practices that have very limited budget. And so we ask ourselves, what is the best way to do marketing in an environment where we're trying to cut our costs? And what we find is that we know specific types of marketing have what we call higher or lower acquisition costs. In other words, how much does it cost in marketing dollars to acquire a patient? Right. Some marketing costs more per patient, some cost less. For example, direct mail. Direct mail has a relatively high cost per patient. But it, many practices still would like to do it because the value in direct mail is not the fact that patients are cheap. The value in direct mail is that you can get a whole lot of patients. Mm -hmm. See, a practice got a wide open schedule um, with a decent marketing budget. Once as many patients as possible, they might use direct mail. Mm -hmm. But if we're trying to cut overhead, if we have a limited marketing budget, direct mail has one of the higher costs. Whereas search engine optimization, believe it or not, has the lowest cost per patient acquired. Really? It was a hard riddle. It took months of analysis for us to even figure out how to measure cost per new patient acquired because we are doing SEO versus not doing SEO. Mm -hmm. But SEO was in our hands the lowest cost per patient. Google AdWords was the second lowest cost. Facebook sponsored ads was the third lowest. And then we go to direct mail. And of course, we're assuming our methodology, split testing, heavy analysis, when we do a Facebook sponsored ad, it's going to be the best one we can do. This is not some doc in his pajamas at home trying out Facebook. Okay, <laughs> right. So when we, if we think about that, SEO, Google AdWords, then we go to Facebook sponsored ads, and then direct mail. When we think about that, if we have a limited budget, we should probably be dropping our marketing budget dollars in that order. Mm -hmm. Fill up SEO costs first, then fill up Google AdWords, because there, there's a point of diminishing returns with Google AdWords. So you'll be able to maybe spend 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, but anything more than that, maybe it's not worth it. So fill up Google AdWords, then fill up Facebook, and then if there's money left over, then go to direct mail. It, it makes sense. But too many dentists just go straight to postcards Yeah, and think that's what they should do. And they're not even split testing postcards. They're not even tracking the calls, tagging the patients. They're just like, praying and gambling that it works. Yep. And they'll spend three, four grand a month or maybe on, on postcards when maybe they should have dropped the dollars in a different order in marketing. Yep. Yeah. Now this is brilliant because you also track, you know, we talk about high acquisition costs and low acquisition costs. You're also tracking um, the value of the patient to the practice in the first year and analyzing where the dollar should be best spent. So it's not rolling the dice, it's investing very carefully. And can you speak to um, the value of a patient in a practice in the first year? Because everybody has their estimates. So, and, and how you use this real quickly. So if, if a dentist is not aware of this, how this works? Well, I, I would love to say a value of a new patient's a thousand bucks. Okay. But the reality is if a patient sees you, you might diagnose a ton of dentistry because you know how to do implants and ortho and you might have high case acceptance 
And so every time you see that patient, it's two grand. Whereas if I see them, I don't do any ortho or implants and I got horrible case acceptance, it might be 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. So what's important is not an assumption, a patient's worth a thousand bucks. What's important is knowing in your practice, when a patient comes in with this message, they're worth two grand. And when they come in with that message, they're worth one, Mm. right? That's what's important. Um, And here's the other thing. And this is another way that, that goes to overhead control. If you send a postcard out, you might have a 62% answer rate on the phones and a 42% conversion scheduling rate. That's the national average. So you get 100 phone calls, you only answer 62, and of the 62, you only end up scheduling uh, 26 new patients. Mm -hmm. So your costs are going to be higher. Because for you to get 50 new patients, you're going to have to spend double on marketing, right? right. Um, and um, and that's a problem. Whereas with me, like we utilize outsourcing, my company, but we utilize outsourcing my practices. So our answer rate's 96%. And our scheduling rate is last, or this month, it was, it's running 77%. Last month, it was in the 80s. So in other words, 100 calls come in, we answer 96 and of those 96, we get 77 new patients. You got 26, I got 77. So you can see how I, I can spend less on marketing than you. My right. overhead is going to be lower. And, uh, and then, again, we got to go down to are we diagnosing enough? Are we getting case acceptance? Because all of that affects overhead. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I talk about one of our offices doing 1.1 million but taking home 600 grand, that is um, a combination of a lot of things. But part of that is great phone coverage, great conversion, so that we spend less on marketing. It's diagnosing a lot of dentistry because the dentist knows how to do a lot of things. It's good case acceptance. having, And, and that's usually had from what the doctor says, what the treatment coordinator says, and what are your payment options? How are they presented? Right? And it's also managing your schedule so that if you get 77 new patients, there's somewhere to put them. Yeah. You're not... Forcing them out one or two months, we're into no-show land. Yeah. So overhead control also has to do with operating your practice in the right way. It's right. not just cutting a cost. It's making sure a patient coming in results in a whole lot of success. Yep. I got a great question here from uh, Deepak who's, who asked the question, any thoughts on relative value of obtaining Google Plus reviews as compared to other digital marketing ranking you provided? You know, thoughts on that? That's a great question. So um, because of the unique tracking we do, we have our hands on pay-per-click and, and, and web development and all that stuff. We see what happens on the click and conversion rate online when you have a lot of reviews compared to when you don't. Right. We also see what happens on the search engine optimization side, the ranking side, if you have a lot of reviews and you don't. We don't know what percent, but there is a portion of your rank that we think is dependent on how many and how frequent you have online reviews. Mm. Also, we know that when you have online reviews that are good, that your conversion on a digital ad, like a Google AdWords ad, is higher. So, and it makes sense, right? It makes sense that if you've got a good online reputation, all your marketing is going to work better because people might look at that reputation. Just like it makes sense that if you're doing Facebook ads and you have a ton of online Facebook reviews, you're going to have a higher conversion. Mm-hmm. Online reviews are vital uh, right. right now to marketing. It used to not be that way. Um, we did a study, um, gosh, it was maybe five years ago or so, when online reviews were just starting to kind of pick up. And we found no correlation inside of one of the DSOs between high online reviews and high profit. We found no correlation. Wow. But that was back then. Now we're seeing a different story. Mm -hmm. Uh, A great story here. We have a startup we built in California, which many people would wonder why the hell are we building a startup in California? But we have a very unique way of figuring out where, where, where we need a new dentist. And we found a spot in California and we built it outside of San Francisco. And the the practice opened uh, with about 30 to 40 new patients a month for three months, way less than what we want. Mm -hmm. And we very quickly pumped up the online reviews we increased our spend on digital marketing because that was the lowest acquisition cost. 
And we now today, two years later, have 120 or 130 Yelp reviews, uh, which is hard. Yelp's hard to get and stick, right? Right. Got lots of Google reviews. But within, by month six or seven, that practice was seeing close to 80 new patients a month. And today, they're over 100. Five-op practice, doing huge numbers, open second year out from scratch, the doctor's taking home, killing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we feel that online reviews in that situation was the spark that lit this fire of growth in that practice. Yeah, I think that's non-negotiable what you're talking about, Google reviews. And the way you teach it, I'm going to have you come back and do a whole show on that because it was brilliant how you teach teams to do that in a more effective man manner. So great question, Deepak. Now, um, I only get you for so long and I want to cover some of the others. Talk about AR uh, and some of the other components that affect overhead. So AR, there's two very important numbers everyone should know about their practice. Okay. And I bet you don't know them. Um, but the first number is called AR days. What this is, it's a, it's a calculation um, that software will have to do for you. Like we use Dental Intel. Mm -hmm. It's a data mining software that dives into our practice management software and it calculates and diagnoses what's going on and it spits it out into a way we understand. Mm -hmm. So AR days. What that is is how many days on average does it take for us to collect a dollar that's owed to us? How many days does it take for us to collect a dollar that's owed to us? That's a very important number. Because see, if I ask you in your practice, are your, are your ARs healthy? Mm -hmm. You may say, yeah, I think so. And I would ask you why. And you'd say, well, because our, our over 90 is only 22,000 and our 30 to 60 is this and our zero to 30 is that. But you know what? Looking at zero to 30, 30, 60, 60, 90, 90 more days, that is completely skewed by your production. Mm -hmm. You could have a really low producing quarter and then have low AR or a high producing quarter and have high AR. Right. There's not an easy way to correlate that. AR days is the key. It, it, that measures our effectiveness to collect a dollar. So what is typical? Um, typical is 40 days and up. Our practices, if we're anything more than 30 days, we're freaking out. So typical for us, we're in the high teens, low 20s. And the way we get there, um, well, first of all, again, I have a whole team and all they do is focus on AR uh, for all these hundreds of offices. Um, but the way we get there is we look at patient AR and insurance AR separately. Okay. So on the insurance AR side, it all starts with the verification. The more complete that insurance verification, the less AR we end up with. So we spend heavily in time and effort to have a complete breakdown set in the employer group and coverage tables of the software. Then we go into the clearinghouse. Uh, the clearinghouse is a, is a program, it's a step that takes all your claims from your practice and before it sends it to the insurance companies, it flags all the ones that might have errors. And all the ones that have errors, it will hold and pause. It's very common in dental offices for none of the team members to, to proactively go and look at the clearinghouse and fix those claims with errors. Right. They should be plugging in every day, and they don't. Um, and so there's there's a big opportunity there to fix those. Then we submit the claim to the insurance company. Many times the claims come back not paid. Well, um, in many practices, if it comes back not paid, it just gets written off. Right. Or, or a patient gets sent a statement. We know that it needs to be resubmitted with more narratives, and we write those narratives. It's got to have more narratives. When we resubmit it, here's a key. We have to log that resubmission into a tracker, like an Excel file, because we know insurance companies are really good at never getting a submission, a resubmission. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. So we will call proactively the insurance company two weeks after we resubmit if it hadn't already been paid. And we know to call them because it's in our tracker. So we're making those calls every day. Um, we also know that many team members are not taking pre-op and post-op x-rays at Crown and Bridge. Right. If we don't now, have a post-op x-ray, it doesn't get paid. Talk about why that's important because that's huge. It's a huge missed opportunity. 
Yeah, so we do chart audits um, to to look, did we get HIPAA signed? Did we get consent form signed? Did we take a pre-op and post-op x-ray on right. Crown Bridge? Without that, insurance companies will make the claim that the patient didn't need the work that you did. And the only way they would accept it is if you had a pre-op and a post-op x-ray. So, you know, it's common. You seat the patient, you're running behind, they need a crown, and you just dive into a crown. And no one took the time to take that one little x-ray that's going to get the whole crown paid. Mm -hmm. so we find that all the time. And then what we find is when the EOB comes back, when the insurance payment comes back, if they did pay, there's all kinds of errors made in how those payments are processed. Just write-offs, just non-stop adjustments that are incorrect. And so what we find when we look at our practices we're connected to is we find rampant mistakes on claims and on ledgers. And we find claims that are expired two years. You can't resubmit them. Mm -hmm. And this whole time, the owner is thinking they're productive, yet they're scratching their heads wondering, why don't I take home more than I, than I do? Because I feel like we're big enough. I should be taking home more money. Right. Times it's on that. And you would catch it if you looked at AR days. Right. Now, th there is a rough number anyone could pull if you don't have dental intel. So let me okay. just give you the rough number. Great. Take, take what you produce every month, your adjusted production, okay? And then look at your total AR and divide the AR by what you produce. So for example, let's say your AR is 150 grand. That's what's owed to you, but you produce 100 grand. Mm -hmm. Divide the two and you get a ratio. 1.5 in this example. 1.5 is normal. Our ratios are 0.62 on average. So a normal ratio is horrible in our eyes. Right. If the ratio is above one, you've got a lot of opportunity in front of you. If it's above 1.5, oh my God, you got a disaster on your hands. Right. Now we're at 0.62. So anyone that's more than 0.62, you know, we'd be able to help. But, um, that's something anyone can look at right now if they log into their software. Right, right. And when you're above that, I mean, you've got a, a cascade of problems. You've got scheduling problems. That's when a dentist, what you're talking about, Scott, is when a dentist looks at it at the end of the year and they go, wow, I worked a third of the year for free. And that's when they start to feel the chest pain. And then they immediately get angry at the insurance companies, you know, and it's it's a, it's a it just goes into the spiral. So totally see what you're talking about. What other considerations do we need to know about overhead before you have to run? I, I love this. Well, I know we just have a couple minutes left, but uh, one quick thing is on patient collections. Mm -hmm. um, we, we will email them statements. We set up an online payment portal and email patient statements and that being online gets more patients to pay. Um, we also send them paper statements and we make collection calls and we will do all three of those things every month for three months. Um, once we do that, if a patient still hasn't paid, they're probably not going to pay. Right. Even if we send them to a collection agency, they probably won't pay. Uh, that's what we found. So we actually don't send them to collection agencies. We label their debt as a bad debt, leave it on the books, and we will try to collect from them face to face the next time they come in if they have an emergency sometime in the future. See, if we send them to collection agency, we're going to get bad reviews. They're going to leave our practice. They're going to be pissed off. They're going to tie up our phone lines calling us. Um, if we do a great job from zero to 90 days, then the people that still haven't paid won't pay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we don't chase those people. We wait until they need us again before we collect the money that they owe us. Um, you know, the, I guess a summary of this is we dentists are in a trench. It's thick, it's busy, it's rough, we're cutting teeth, we're managing staff, we're worried about money, all this stuff at once. And we can correct overhead problems with best practices. Right. We don't have to compromise our materials, compromise by hiring cheap people or driving up volume with Medicaid. Like we don't have to go down that path. There's so much inefficiency that if we finally um, recognize it, like own up to it, say, yes, I have a problem, right? <laughs> My name's Scott Luna. I have a problem. Okay? If we right. finally own up to that. Best practices will solve it without compromise. Right. Um, I guess that's the, the name of the game here. That's what I'm trying to communicate. Hey, buddy, this is genius. Now, 
Um, please tell us, you know, I, I'm just going to say this. If you haven't been to Breakaway, you got to go. So, but there's a couple courses. You have a startup course. You've got the business mastery course. Can you describe what that is, how long they are, how it works? How do I get to Breakaway? Yeah, we, we offer different business seminars. Um, we have a, a seminar for startups or, or dentists that are going to be expanding or moving their practice. Mm-hmm. So that's a two-day course. Uh, we offer it eight times a year, and a dentist that goes ends up saving about two or three hundred thousand dollars on building a new practice. Mm-hmm. Um, then we got a course we call our business masters course. That's our big one. Um, we offer we only offer that five times a year or so. Um, it's like it is four hundred pages of here's step by step what you do to run a highly successful practice in an ethical way. Right. Um, we also have a seminar we give twice a year on how to build multiple locations, groups. What do you need to know? How do you manage it? How do you bring on dentists? How, how do you get funding? That's called our enterprise seminar. Um, and then one thing I mentioned is this whole um, best practices on cost control with supplies. We've got a team that does that. If any dentist wants us to kind of scan what they're doing and what they're paying and what their process is, we can scan that and give them a really good idea on on what we'd be able to do for them but you know our seminars they're really cool you know hold on one second go ahead (laughs) there they are yep so i'm holding about 1100 pages right now right so i think it's a great starting point if anyone likes what i'm saying and wants to learn more about us the seminars are pretty cool Yeah. And I will just say this. You are a fabulous, fabulous teacher. Uh, There's not one second you're bored and uh, it's brilliant, brilliant stuff. You also do the outsourcing. So uh, and we'll get into this uh, uh, on other shows, Uh, the insurance verification, phone calls, all that kind of stuff. So if you just stuck and you hate doing that stuff and you're not good at it it's a good argument let somebody else do it so check it out at breakaway practice so thank you buddy for being on i really really appreciate this and um again if you're watching this please ask some great questions we'll get the answers for you and scott is brilliant at that and um, scott i look forward to having you back for many of these on different topics so thank you brother stick out stick around for just a second here and if you're watching the show thank you for watching uh please hit the share button if you're finding this valuable and until we see you next time keep watching the best practices show thanks a lot Thank you.